Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Larry Beeman, and I'm the Chief Growth Officer at GenVideo. Uh, that's an influencer and social commerce company, if you're not familiar, which you're not. Um, and I'm here today with Vivian Chang, who is the head of DTC at Clorox, um, and also Calvin Lammers, who is the SVP of e-commerce um, at Truff. Um, so those can be very big titles, so I think we'd like to start with um, giving a little intro to what you do at the company, what you handle, so people can understand your perspective. And then also for, I think we know Clorox probably pretty well here, but Truff maybe is a little less familiar for those if you can give a little elevator pitch on that as well. Um, Vivian, you want to start? Sure. Uh, good morning, everyone. Happy to be here. Uh, Clorox, the cleaning brand, is really well known to everyone, but actually prior to you know, myself joining, I didn't understand all of the different brands underneath the portfolio. And so direct to consumer, we're es essentially a group that is internal uh, incubating and building capability of actual brand.com transactions with consumers. Uh, and so it is not live for every brand, uh, for, but for the brands that make sense, for example, Burt's Bees, uh, a lot of the supplements brands, we did just launch the shop.clorox.com this past summer. Um, all of the building, the underlying technology, as well as the acquisition retention efforts for that closed loop data capture uh, for direct to consumer runs through my team. And so uh, a lot of my team it acts almost like embedded underneath the different brands. And uh, for myself, as uh, Larry mentioned, SVP of Ecom at Truff. For those who don't know Truff, our truffle-infused condiment uh, brand. Now we have a, a salt as well. Uh, started with our original uh, hot sauce. Uh, we actually are a digitally native brand. Uh, we launched first with our, our DTC site, have since expanded onto Amazon, and now we're in uh, 15,000 uh, uh, plus retail locations. So true you know, omni-channel brand. Uh, obviously, DTC is, is still kind of at the core and foundation of the brand. Uh, so in my role as uh, SVP at Ecom, oversee all digital platforms. And obviously, that's grown tremendously over the last year. So now that we do have a number of last, last mile delivery partners, Ecom marketplaces, it's been really interesting to see how um, you know, we've evolved, obviously, uh, the role of DTC within uh, the company and the brand um, you know, with these new new channels. Um, so yeah, excited to, to be here and, and talk more about this. Awesome. Um, so today we're here to talk about the future of DTC. I've said it too many times now and I'm mixing it up. Um, and so to get there, I think it'll be best to talk about starting one, what you've learned along the way, what you want to get out of it in the future. Um, and so at Truff, it started as a DTC, um, and I imagine because that's the easiest route to get out there. I don't know if you did the company consider Shark Tank as a part of a growth channel. <laughs> I think it was definitely a, a consideration. That's, that's definitely, a, a, I guess, a, a quicker way to, to see that quick growth uh, <laughs> yeah. online for sure. Yeah. Um, and then Vivian at Clorox specifically, you kind of went the reverse model of already had the distribution channels going back. So I think we're going to start there of why did Clorox want to make this one of the channels when already having such large distribution through um, third parties? Yeah, it's, it's certainly been a journey. I've been at Clorox now about three and a half years came from actual kind of direct to consumer digitally native startups and e-commerce startups and so forth. Uh, so first foray into CPG world. Um, but we actually started uh, with the original idea of building and launching pure play D to C, or you can only buy it online brands. And uh, about two years ago, realized that the larger per uh, potential for the enterprise is to launch and amplify the existing brands. And so we've kind of walked away from that strategy for the most part of pure play, kept the in-house talent across all of your growth and um, product type functions and are redeploying them against the different brands. Um, and the, the idea is never to be a channel conflict. Again, with retailer.coms, Amazons, there's a ton of reasons why consumers are still going to want to just add Clorox bleach to their shopping cart when they're at Target, right? Um, but DTC is unique in that we have closed loop data um, and actually have first party consumer data. And so the uh, what we're trying to build is how to use this as a true insights and incubation hub to do tests and learns, develop a playbook of what works, and then translate that into our broader 
brand awareness, national media campaigns, what do we actually do for PDPs on Amazon, how can we show initial success through D2C and then bring that to the uh, in-store conversations with a Target and Walmart and so forth. And so for me, coming from direct-to-consumer startups where that revenue was king and end-all be-all, it has been a mental shift to say, like, what's the power of it within the larger portfolio? Absolutely. And so, Calvin, for you, kind of the um, reverse to that, what have been the benefits of um, and the successes of starting with a D2C and, and growing the business in the reverse model? Yeah, and I think, um, you know, for myself, uh, this is actually the first digitally native brand that I've worked at. In the past, I've worked at brands that either, you know, started with their retail business and then it, it launched DTC later or concurrently. Um, so it's, it's been interesting to kind of see this journey for, for Trump starting digitally native. And I think, uh, you know, as you kind of mentioned, uh, right off the bat, the benefit for an emerging brand is that you aren't going through the selling story and obviously, you know, POG resets for, with retailers. You know, you have, you know, assuming you have have a, a national 3PL, you have national distribution and, and widespread availability to the in, entire country. So um, that's what we were able to leverage from the early early days and, and really kind of tap into this consumer moment um, with, with a great social following, um, you know, really built up our audience and engagement uh, via our, our social channels, turn that into you know, a really uh, quickly growing DTC business. Um, while not uh, Shark Tank, uh, we, we also did get uh, Oprah, uh, Oprah's assistance and uh, we've now been on Oprah's favorite things list uh, for out of the five years that the brand's been around. So that certainly helped. Um, but really all that kind of social validation and, and buzz and engagement to online really um, helped tell that story as we started pitching into uh, retailers, actually. So we had that data. We had those insights. We had, obviously, the online sales velocities um, to tell the story and, and kind of you know have that validation when we were going to Whole Foods, which is our, our first national uh, retailer um, that yes people you know, are excited about there is demand there is interest in a $14 hot sauce uh, and that obviously without that data um, you know would have been tough to tell that story I think so that's been crucial for us as, as we've grown I'll pay anything for hot sauce um, so it's not always a six dollar ROAS story a media callback for those that were here um, what were the struggles that you've come across along the way, whether internally or externally, as you've done the business? Vivian? Um, I'll start. It's more struggles than anything else, I feel like, as I did today. Um, I think everything I just talked about earlier, right, of insights and how do you amplify and how do you do tests and learns, how we are connect, collecting arguably the most valuable and rich first-party data to amplify. It's really hard to actually quantify dollar value to any of those things. And so, um, you know, collectively we've held hands and said it's not just about revenue, it's not just about ROAS, and we believe in these areas. But uh, I think it's, you know, it's kind of a short window of time where we're really racing to, you know, put some dollars against these benefits and really kind of do small scale tests so that we can uh, start to say, what does that do once you scale it across the larger portfolio? And so I think that's the biggest challenge is this world of kind of fuzzy attribution of the things that we believe are right and consumers you want, um, but not having that like hard data to back it up right now. Absolutely. And Calvin, who hurt you? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a, it's a good question. It's, it's been interesting. Um, <laughs> Um, so it's it's been interesting because I think I've actually had to uh, take off my performance hat in a, in a way in that uh, obviously as a digitally native brand that has since expanded into retail um, we've we've lost that that complete closed loop. Um, you know, it was much easier when our only business was DTC. So any media we ran, we could you know, truly measure from end to end the the, the full attrib attribution and impact. Uh, now that we obviously have fifteen thousand, you know plus retail locations, other marketplaces, um, that's become much, much murkier and, and, and much tougher to measure. So um, it's, it's been an interesting journey to, to have those conversations with um, you know, our team and, and founders about uh, actually building a brand, which, you know, again, as an e-commerce you know, uh, person with, with a performance kind of mindset, um, it's been interesting to be in that position um, to maybe at the detriment of the DTC, DTC business 
in the short term on, on the revenue side, um, making some of those choices to um, shift some dollars uh, into you know, whether that's retail media, into brand brand building, brand marketing. Um, that's been an interesting journey and conversation um, in trying to get the focus out of you know, away from just ROAS um, and having a little bit longer term view. So I think that's been uh, uh, an evolution and conversation over the past uh, year, year and a half that I've been there. I thought of something, if I can add it, because um, it's spurred by what you're saying. I mean, some of it is just the challenge internally of folks who have come, my team, a lot of folks have come from direct-to-consumer or you know, other startups. And internally, it's just finding the right people to be talking to each other, to share what's going on, to assume good intent because a brand marketer is going to approach things and even say terms very different from a performance marketer. And ultimately, we're obviously all trying to grow the brands, but you know, building those internal bridges, I think it goes a long way. It, you know, I think doesn't get talked about enough as like a real organizational challenge in a big space like a Clorox or you know, like a Nestle. Yeah, I think we'll go back and forth a little bit here because I think that is something in my career I've seen that even still, even you know the pro proliferation of DTC and e-commerce, there still I think is you know maybe sometimes an, an idea that uh, you know the e-com or the DTC team is maybe stealing or kind of um, cannibalizing some of the other businesses. So I think yeah, there, there's a lot of internal selling and and kind of team building and, and kind of bridge building um, to make sure that you're you're kind of showing that's not the case and, and what the value are actually kind of bringing to the the, the different teams and different departments. So 100. percent Right. So what I'm hearing is you know when I think people think about initial DTCs, they think sales channel. That's you know very drastically changing once you get to the three P's and scale. Um, you know I'm hearing more in um, R and D and innovation and consumer insights. Um, so I guess do you have any um, interesting stories of like insights that you've pulled out from the testing with the D 2 C that you've been able to deploy um, in a larger business um, format or, or larger channel distribution? Um, I guess I can I can kick in. I'm not sure when we uh, we were planning on showing uh, said video, but um, I think maybe that was the tee up. But uh, roll, roll uh, the tape. <laughs> roll the tape. <laughs> <laughs> I think we got it. Here we go. Um, so that's where it actually was serendipitous that obviously Vivian and I are on, on the same stage here as uh, Clorox and Truff actually did uh, partner this past year on this limited limited time drop with our, our Truff Hidden Valley Ranch. Um, and so obviously super excited about how that turned out. Um, I think it was, it was a very um, exciting partnership that, that came about and see how that kind of came to fruition. Um, and I think it was an insight that uh, it, it was really cool to see obviously very different kind of stages of businesses, sizes of businesses. Um, but there was an interest in, you know, how we kind of, um, you know, Cross collab and, and kind of take the see social profile and presence and online presence that we have, um, you know, and, and help build this big brand moment uh, for Truff in, in Hidden Valley, um, and it absolutely blew us away um, in terms of the response. You know, we we grew our SMS list by over four hundred percent. We had I think it was over four hundred million uh, media impressions from the PR pickup. Um, we sold out in less than three minutes, so it was absolutely you know phenomenal smashing success and this is an instance where um you know more to come we're having further conversations but um it was such a success um with this limited time you know only uh, online drop that you know having conversations about how can we you know bring this possibly to retail as a permanent skew or a longer term skew and it was you know only because we had that opportunity and infrastructure to um launch something like this and then build that that moment that uh um, we could do something like that so it was pretty exciting I'm upset that I never got to try it myself. <laughs> <laughs> it was a hot, hot commodity for sure. <laughs> um, so Vivian, I know we talked about this yesterday. If you want to expand a little on the exciting part for a company the size of Clorox to work on a launch like this in D2C and like the agileness that comes with it versus the normal channels. Yeah. Um, I think like it's partially about 
opening up the aperture of like, what does CDC mean? Um, and longer term would love the vision of saying, okay, how can we build something like a shoppable marketplace where we actually can showcase smaller brands or startups doing interesting things? Like Brita is a good example. We have obviously the pitchers and the bottles, but there's a lot of kind of new apps or other um, other players that are inventing kind of water testing kits, right? How can we showcase that and make it shoppable through through our site and kind of leverage the power of our brand? So um, I think it's that. It's helping to push the envelope of what are we actually selling. It's not purely just about brand building and traditional brick and mortar distribution anymore. It's about how can we come aside, come aside um, a consumer and actually provide the full suite of things that they would find interesting. How can we surprise and delight, introduce them to new brands that they might love that aren't even ours. Um, and so that's, you know, there's the technology, underlying technology part that we're building, which is a lot of the unsexy piece of the work, uh, the fulfillment and, and so forth, but it really is about better understanding our consumers and meeting those needs, even if it's not necessarily the products that we have internally. And so I think this was a great example of taking that risk and, um, you know, who's just like evaluating who's the better player to actually like sell the product then, right? Like Trough is going to be way more nimble. They have a really avid loyal base. And so you're know, lending the, the Hidden Valley Ranch like brand alongside that, but we're not also then distributing and competing against Trough. Amazing. Um, speaking to that, though, are we going to do a full distribution on the product? I mean, I, I hope so. That would be amazing. Uh, yeah, the, the, the more people to, to try the Hidden Valley Ranch, uh, uh, the Truff Hidden Valley Ranch, the, the better. Uh, I did get my hands on, on one. They were limited, and it was very good. <laughs> amazing. Don't tell me twice. Hopefully it's at lunch. Um, We've talked about the benefits for the businesses, so being agile, being able to get first-party data, being able to make decisions about what products to make and distribute in a larger way. But as marketers, we always have to remember not to be selfish and only think about us. So for the consumer standpoint, when you're talking about shifts in perspective, how do you make sure that you're making decisions that are right for the consumer when you work in this area instead of just saying like, no, come shop here. Don't go to Target. Come here only because I want it to to track everything together. Yeah, it's a t it's a lot of what we do and a lot of kind of I'd say hard lessons learned, right? Because from the Clorox side, the benefits are really clear: right? the data capture, the closed loop, the testing, and so forth. But why to a consumer? And that's been a really challenging question to answer when you also have kind of like pricing limitations, promotion limitations, you don't want to create channel conflict. And so we've been really working with the brands to do more like insights work and research. So the uh, shop.clorox that we launched this past summer was based off of a, an insight that younger consumers, Gen Z millennials, find shopping for cleaning supplies really overwhelming and confusing, right? Like, do I really need different wipes for the bathroom versus the kitchen? And what does this disinfecting mist do? Now I've got, you know, I'm staring at this giant shelf at Target. You know, how do I shop? And so our D2C experience is a limited catalog. It's guided selling through a quiz. And there's a very simple build your own bundle. And so I'd be like, choose a wipe, choose a toilet cleaner, maybe choose something for laundry if you want it. Um, and so that is where we're seeing a lot of success because it's much more focused, which you would not do in, on an Amazon or you know, a Target. You, you don't have that ability to do the guided selling. And then along the way, we're learning a ton about like how do people want to create bundles and using that to then have the conversations back with retailers. So I think it's like really pushing on. I wouldn't say we've cracked it entirely. Um, but at least this was an example where we've learned to be more focused rather than trying to be everything to everyone. Amazing. And then Calvin, for for yourself, um, is there like a self-guided find your flavor tour that 
that's the value prop to customers D to C? So not yet. We're actually in the process of, of building that out. Um, as yeah, that that's I think one of the values that we're we're you know creating and in, in, you know in the process of you know expanding. I guess is that using our, our DTC site as that discovery platform for new customers. We're still a small brand, very low you know overall brand awareness uh, across the country. So we have a lot of work to do. And I think having a DTC site that also is educational, informational, and a true experience to help them guide you know if they don't know truffles, if they haven't had. Truffles, before, you know, what is that flavor profile like? What recipes, what types of dishes would you use it with? Um, so I think also incorporating that, you know, content and education as well is kind of crucial to that DC, DTC experience for us. Um, and I think we're, we've also been able to leverage um, kind of the value with, you know, the exclusive, you know, drops or flavors such as the, the, the ranch drop um, that's only available, you know, first um, on our DTC site. So I think that's been important to continue to build up and, um, you know, reinforce that, you know, our, our DTC loyalists and, and you know, high LTV customers um, have that exclusive access. And then the other piece that I think we've been, you know, able to really leverage on our DTC site is we have great, you know, obviously great branding, great packaging, um, and we have gift, um, you know, gift packs and gift items that uh, really uh, we, we've seen a huge, um, you know, influx in that during Q4 and gifting season. So really built out the overall gift messaging, gift wrapping option as well, so that your know, consumers going to our DTC site have that opportunity to gift our products um, and give gift that experience in a way that obviously you know, you can't do you know anywhere else. So uh, building out that whole experience a little bit more than you know, any other kind of location you might buy our products, which is a little bit more transactional. Um, and that's where the DTC um, site still is, is playing a heavy role, I think, for us. Got it. Yeah, that's a great idea. Christmas present planning. <laughs> um, so let's pivot back to pain a little bit. Um, Vivian, you had mentioned earlier, you know, measurement being one of the tough parts um, so far. I guess, have there been any wins in that area of, obviously with D2C, it's, you know, immediate transaction, but obviously it's playing a bigger role across the organization. Have there been any, any immediate wins with organizations, tools, methodology, and ways that you're able to, to see the impact beyond just direct sale on the site? Or either one jump in. I'll, I'll kick things off, I guess. Um, so I think, yeah, I, I mentioned this earlier. Obviously, it, it gets tougher when you have more channels and an offline component, obviously. But I think you still do have the the ability to get at least you know an initial you know directional read on whether that's messaging or media uh, channels. Obviously, for for Truff, you started off primarily or almost exclusively with all, all of our media on on paid social. Has six, six, since expanded into you know, retail media, you know marketplace media, um, direct mail out of home so a number of different um, you know media channels so I think it's that's been you know interesting to see that while you know and I, I think we, we, we discussed this during kind of the, the prep call we do we do not have the the budget for an MMM tool um, and even then you know it's it only kind of gets you, you know, to a certain you know, uh, level of, of insights or accuracies so um, being able to at least use some of that um, your initial read um, you know kind of initial um, your data from a digital perspective to uh, measure your know, impact performance from your different messaging media, um, I think has been helpful for how we kind of roll out different messaging, marketing, um, you know, kind of messaging with our retail POS material as well. So I think that's how we've um, leveraged that, at least in these these early stages. Yeah, um, I think first kind of um, painting the picture of how messy it can be, right? We've got, especially as media has really quickly evolved that now there's retail media, which traditionally for us was more on the sales teams and channel teams managing that Amazon, which you know has its own beast of all the things you have to feed into Amazon to make it work. We've obviously got direct to consumer where we have performance media channel specialists, and then you've got your brand marketing teams, right? So you've got different people touching each of those all for good reason, but how do you actually drive coordination? And like step one was very simply finding who's touching what and getting them talking to get together. And you know, now we're starting to say, okay, how do we think about it differently? So like a measurement success, which is actually kind of antithetical to D2C is doing some Google, Google ads that are driving to Amazon. And we're seeing like success there and good lift. And it's a play for short-term revenue. Um, but that is 
a way that we can at least measure the, the effectiveness. And even if it's short term, that it's something that serves the broader business goal. Um, and so that's an idea, an area of like breaking down silos and the traditional ways of you know, how we would have bought and measured. Um, and then along the way, would like tons of conversations of uh, we have media mix modeling, but it's not perfect. D to C, especially for a new newly launched platform, it's going to be a blip. It doesn't even show up in the reads, right? Um, and so, you know, how do you think about it in different ways through holdout tests or um, just like what are the creative insights that we leverage? So it's not always revenue-based measurement. Right. So I would be remiss if I didn't talk about our girl COVID, um, always around. How has that played into anything and kind of seeing where people are going of, you know, living their life at home, we're back in person sometimes. Um, what effect do you see that playing on the future of D2Cs, just change in behavior based on COVID? Uh, I think some of the most interesting kind of like macro trends I've seen, I think like McKenzie did the study or something, um, you know, there's been like a 30% lift in e-commerce since COVID. So obviously it was high during COVID, but the new foundation and level set is much higher, right? And the majority of consumers are shopping both in researching and shopping, both in store online and more appetite for discovering new brands and brands that um, resonate with their, their own values. So I think all of these are forces that are changing the conversation that we're having internally and how we um, work with our retail partners. And so you know, I think part of it is building this underlying technology that I said so that we can quickly scale future brands within the portfolio to turn on D2C or to do just an R&D you know, product innovation test. Um, I think COVID made it really clear that for a lot of uh, companies were kind of caught on the back foot a little bit. And so now it's much more like, how do we think proactively? How do we have it ready? Maybe, maybe not have an always on D2C platform for every brand, but um, you know, if the need uh, calls, like what we're really trying to build is being able to spin up a storefront in a matter of like four weeks. And yeah, just uh, to add on my end, yeah, I think it's um, been interesting to see that it's also, I think, become a quick realization that there needs to be a you know, larger, longer term strategy and value prop for DTC and that it can't, it shouldn't be you know, spun up as a quick revenue uh, uh, play uh, for, for any company of any size, I think, um, because obviously that you saw a quick uh, uptick in overall e you know, DTC sales during COVID that have since, you know, subsided, obviously still, you know, at a, a higher penetration than it was, you know, going into COVID. But I think what's important to see is that, you know, the influence that, you know, e-commerce and digital still has. So you're still seeing, you know, 60% of all sales being digitally influenced. So that is not subsiding. So it's, you know, kind of taking a different approach and, and kind of, kind of look on where e and DTC is playing um, and in how it's influencing the broader business and, and not just focus on on revenue. Um, and so building a, a strategy and, and team and biz, DTC business around that, um, I think is, is you know, becoming more clear as, as that should be the goal. Yeah, absolutely. So in these innovation talks, I always like to say like, what's up five, 10 years down the road, but you kind of both just answered that. So I kind of really took my thunder here. Um, but so, you know, in thinking about the uh, incubations, places and R&D places to, to make these big bets in other channels. Are there other weird, interesting things that you're planning or doing or already doing, like are NFTs being sold on these DTCs or, or anything like that as we look to Web3? Or is that too far? I mean, I, I know they are. We, we have not delved into that. Uh, so, and I, I don't think we, we will anytime soon. Um, I think the NFT market is, is having a tough moment as well. So we'll probably hold on that too for risky. the time being. Yeah. Great. Um, questions? Hi, this is Mar for for Bibi. And you mentioned when you were talking about the the store, right? The, the going through the experience of shopping for for cleaners can be complicated, right? You see that in other categories like laundry care, right? Like how many bottles tides do you need on the shelf? Um, <clears throat> I think you can uncover some really interesting insights uh, that then you should be able to translate to your brick and mortar, right? To your to your shopper side. 
have you have you guys tried doing that and and if so have you uncovered any like hesitancy from the retailer side as you say like hey the shelf is organized this way but in reality shoppers are looking for this and this is kind of like the path to purchase yeah that's really interesting uh i wouldn't say that we we're not there yet on um the in-store like uh merchandising impact we're doing we're learning a lot on digital merchandising um, and so it's very much about taking those learnings that we see of, you know, what's the benefit and what do consumer, maybe it's an image or a video for the product and translating that to how we show up on third party marketplaces, Amazon and so forth. So um, it is disseminating, but it, yeah, I like that idea. We're not there yet. Others? So this is also more towards you, Vivian. And first of all, Clorox got me through the pandemic. I think I really <laughs> stocked up Happy there. Um, but just like, so you talked a little bit about the tension of selling it in in Clorox and, you know, the tension and finding consumer insights and why, you know, ultimately thinking of the consumer and their needs. But as retailers heavily invested in their own online capabilities during the pandemic, how did you manage potentially like partnering, but also like, was it a challenge? Like, did they feel like this was a challenge on their end that like you guys weren't like partnering with them? Or did they also see the value of you guys still supporting their online, the Instacarts of the world while also looking for new paths internally? Yeah. Um, I think luckily, um, you know, during COVID is more just about like getting supply out there. And oftentimes we, we did have to make decisions and say, yeah, we're going to provide product to target and potentially sell out on D2C, right? Which is painful for, for us. Um, but that's the better choice for the business and being willing to make those sacrifices. Um, I think the other piece is we are starting to think about how do we do like product launch, new product launches, exclusives, and balancing it not just on D2C, but it's like D2C and. Um, so with like a retailer's digital experience or something like that, um, that's how we're, we're going to those conversations and being open to that right now.